What is up, everyone? Adam Stokowiak here, editor-in-chief of Changelog. We teamed up with some friends of ours over at Heroku to promote their podcast called Codish. You can check it out at heroku.com slash podcasts slash Codish. And today we're dropping a full-length episode right here in the JS Party feed featuring o and of Heroku, joined by Tamba Gopal, talking about the pros and cons of using GraphQL in your applications. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to Codish, an exploration of the lives of modern developers. Join us as we dive into topics like languages and frameworks, data and event-driven architectures, and individual and team productivity, all tailored to developers and engineering leaders. This episode is part of our deeply technical series. Hello, welcome to the Codish podcast. My name is Owen O. I'm an engineer from Heroku. With me today, we have Tamai Gopal, a CEO from a company called Hasaru. Today, we are going to talk about GraphQL. So what is GraphQL and what is the motivation behind it? GraphQL is uh, API specification, very similar to REST uh, and very similar to SOAP before that. Um, and it's an API specification uh, that focuses on making data fetch kind of API calls easy especially for front-end applications. It is a specification that is agnostic to language or framework um, and even protocol. So you can implement a GraphQL on top of HTTP or something else, and you can implement a GraphQL server and a GraphQL client in any language, uh, in any framework, um, and it is independent to that. Again, very similar to the way REST um, and so forth. The key motivation behind GraphQL was um, to make it easier for uh, front-end developers um, and application developers to make API calls um, and to fetch data from API calls. There are some nuances around that, and I can I can dive deeper, but um, it was primarily designed for application developers to be able to build quickly and to be able to integrate APIs uh, and use APIs inside their applications uh, faster. Yeah, that's excellent. So you mentioned about uh, client-side application. So like what kind of client side application are you talking about a browser app or a CRR app? Yeah, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about browser applications or I'm talking about uh, web applications and mobile applications. In fact, GraphQL first started getting used in Facebook for the iOS application. So even for mobile applications, uh, but basically developers who are kind of building front end uh, user facing applications, uh, it's it was primarily designed for them. Uh, but GraphQL, just like any other API, can technically use any client and server. But you can see direct features in the design that make it uh, very suitable for front-end applications. Got it. So GraphQL would be another one that I consider if I implement my client application. So maybe before comparing REST with GraphQL, what would be the cost and benefit of implementing GraphQL? So, so there are technical costs and benefits, of course, to implementing GraphQL. But one of the most um, important motivations or, or kind of, I think, the primary uh, benefit to GraphQL and where GraphQL shines is going to be where you are building a web API and the consumers of your API are mostly going to be um, front-end applications, right? So that's that's the case where you would think about saying, well, maybe maybe I don't expose a REST API, but you know, maybe I expose a GraphQL API. And, and the reason why this has a tremendous amount of benefit is because, like, as a front-end developer, if I wear the shoes of a front-end developer, I love building out the application. I love caring about the user experience. I love um, making sure that users you know, love the product that I build. Uh, but the part that I hate is the part where I need to integrate APIs to actually make the application work, right? And, um, and this bit is painful because traditionally with APIs, um, you know, if you just think about integrating an API, the first thing is that uh, most modern applications today, the same screen that you look at, the same web page or the same mobile screen that you're looking at, you you actually make a, a variety of API calls to kind of different things, right? Maybe you're making a SaaS API, it, uh, API call to a SaaS service. Maybe you're making an API call to your own web server. Um, you're fetching different kinds of resources. Let's say, for example, you're building a profile page. You know, you need to you need to make an API call to fetch the user information, like the username and email. And then maybe you need to make another API call to fetch the address information. You want to show that you know the last five addresses 
of this user on their profile page. So you make another API call for doing that. And soon you realize that for kind of pages that are becoming complicated, you realize that you as a front end developer start making you know lots of API calls. And uh, this process is painful because you have uh, API calls are asynchronous. So um, you know, you you make an API call, you wait for the network to kind of give you data, and then the user is kind of blocked till then, and then they kind of see data coming in, right? Uh, and imagine if you have like five or six API calls, you just have different parts of the screen kind of loading in different speeds, or you know, you have to take care of issues like that. Um, and and these are things that you'd already figured out when you built the app, but then when you did the API integration, you know, everything was it wasn't fun. And uh, and this is not a new problem, right? This is a fairly old problem. And so what people started doing was they said, you know, we'll have something like a BFF, like a backend for frontend, um, and we'll aggregate this API. So we'll give, we'll provide one API where you can fetch all the other five like resources that you wanted and show that on your screen. This was kind of becoming a pattern. Um, meanwhile, simultaneously on the Facebook side, they said, you know what? What if we create um, and what if we like? think about all these problems that front-end developers face. And we kind of solve this problem more systematically, right? So what they did was they said, instead of making uh, a bunch of API calls, why don't we all have a single API endpoint? Let's give this endpoint to the front-end developer team. And, and what that dev team can do is say, I can make an API call. And instead of you know specifying the resource that I want as a part of the URL, so instead of saying something like, I want to get a slash user or slash user a slash address instead of saying something like that you can now say you know slash graphql and what you submit to this endpoint is a query so you make a post request where you submit a query and you say i want i query for user and within user i want id comma name and i want address and within address which is like a you know like a nested node inside the user object i want um, address dot id address dot street address dot city address dot country right and you can specify exactly the shape uh, of the resource that you want and the graphql server then kind of figures out that oh, okay you need to fetch like three or four different resources so uh, let's make this uh, api call and and let's let's fetch all these resources and let's send these resources to the front end so from the front end developer's point of view now it's a great experience, right? Because now I can make one API call, I can specify in that API my query, uh, and I can get exactly the data that I want. Um, and so this is a huge benefit to the front-end developer. What you're saying is GraphQL allow me to have one endpoint that can query all the domain logic that I want to query. Exactly, exactly. And it's very similar to imagine that as a, you know, as, as maybe if you're building a web API, right? Uh, as a developer, you have something like SQL or like, you know, a query language with Mongo or something like that. You have, you have, you have SQL and using SQL, you can query everything in the database, right? You can, mm -hmm. you can query anything in the database that you want. And SQL is great for doing that. Um, but imagine if the database gave you like rest endpoints, right? Wouldn't you be like, it would be so irritating. For the backend developer, because every time you want to like you know fetch something interesting, you want to maybe do a join, you want to do some filtering. It's so inconvenient because you kind of want to fetch, you want to make a better query for fetching you know the entire kind of quote unquote graph or relationship structure that you want. Um, GraphQL is very analogous to that power. It gives the front end developer that kind of power, right? That kind of flexibility in saying here are the domain resources. And here is my query for fetching the precise slice of domain resources that I want. And that power is so amazing for front-end developers because now they don't have to wait for back-end developers to create new endpoints, right? They can always query for exactly what they want um, as long as somehow the domain models are represented on the back-end. Um, it's a great experience for front-end developers. So how would I get started creating a GraphQL application? Do I define right. some sort of schema to open up my API endpoint, or how, how would I get started? It's very similar to how you would get started with uh, with how you would get started with building just a normal API and a client server web application, right? So you, on the front end, um, you know, you're building your app, you start making API calls, and you use something like a REST client, or you use some kind of HTTP client. So on the front end, you know, you build your front end, but instead of using an HTTP client, you use a GraphQL client. Um, and a GraphQL client is basically a simple wrapper on top of an HTTP client, which allows you to conveniently create queries, uh, 
And then, you know, you don't have to put in the exact URL and the parameters. You just have to sub, you just write out your GraphQL query and you get the data and then you can start using that data in your um, application. And on the back end, um, very similar to how you have, um, you know, how you would build a REST server or like, you know, maybe just an API server. Uh, a typical pattern is that you create something like a routes file or a URLs file, right? And so you specify the different URL paths and the different resources that you want to make available. So maybe you say I have a get endpoint for user, you have a get endpoint for user address, you have a post endpoint for, um, you know, creating a user and stuff like that. Um, and then you would have in, in the in the in the REST API world, you would have kind of mapped these uh, URLs to functions. And these functions or controllers would have actually um, executed some kind of data fetching logic or some security and authorization logic, and then uh, returned that data or returned that JSON. Um, in, in the GraphQL world, it's very similar. But instead of mapping URLs to functions, what you do is you map, uh, you create GraphQL uh, types, right? So you say, I have a user type and I have, let's say, an address type. And every user has an address. And so what you do is you say, this is the user type. I'm going to have an address field inside the user type, which is a reference to the address type, right? So you kind of create these two types that are linked to each other. Um, and then for each, each of these kind of types or fields, you attach a function. So you say that if somebody requests for the user like field or the user type, then this function can execute the logic for fetching the exact data for user, right? And similarly for address, you specify a function and you say this function knows how to fetch the address information. So now if the front-end application makes a query and says, I want user ID one, uh, name and address, and for address, I want address.city. Right. So what happens is your server will execute the function for user, execute the function for address. It will run these two functions and then kind of get the data, put it into a JSON structure and then respond to the client. So very similar to what you would have done, like no magic. It's just that uh, instead of instead of having something that can process a URL and map it to a function, you instead process a query and map it to a function. Um, these functions are called resolvers. So you map fields to resolvers, like you map URLs to controllers, uh, very similar. Um, so what what would be a case is that GraphQL would not be a good fit? So a GraphQL API, um, you know, from the description, like I was I was giving you, it seems it would be it's quite clear that if you have, uh, you know, you you can model your uh, domain objects with a schema, and then every time I make a request, you return some JSON data, right? Um, that itself will kind of point out those conditions where you realize that GraphQL is not a good fit. For example, if you have binary data, right? Let's say, for example, I make a request and I say, I want to fetch an image, right? Or I want to fetch a video, right? Or I need to fetch a stream of, of some data. Um, in those cases, GraphQL is not ideal. Or even if the return, if the return, if the response is not JSON, well, that's a pretty clear fit for not being a great fit for GraphQL. Uh, but even if you have things like streaming or you have binary data, that's not a good fit for GraphQL as well. And sometimes depending on the application that you have, uh, you know, you, you might not, you, you, you might realize that the way that you're modeling, uh, the way that your API models are uh, built, uh, it doesn't really fit with GraphQL or, you know, maybe it's very chatty. Maybe the client and the server are kind of very chatty. Maybe it's an internal application, it's very chatty. Um, and it's it's not a great fit for GraphQL. But in most applications that we think about in the web and mobile landscape, um, GraphQL actually ends up being a really good fit. So now let's uh, change a little bit of the topic to uh, the adoption of GraphQL. What is driving GraphQL mm -hmm. adoption today? GraphQL makes the front end and the dev, the app dev team, it gives them superpowers, right? Um, it makes them very productive. So in all of the cases where the end user application and the quality of the end user application and the agility of being able to add, remove, and iterate on features of the end user application is important, um, GraphQL becomes very useful. So wherever we notice that the business drivers are closely correlated to um, the quality of the end user application, GraphQL starts kind of sneaking in and the front end team says, you know what, if you want us to be productive, give us a GraphQL API. Um, and that's kind of the primary vector. Um, and that kind of also answers situations where you know, you, GraphQL is not a primary vector.
right? So that's kind of the primary reason. And and what and what we notice in the world today is that um, so much of the way that we use technology and the way people are using technology ha- has shifted to being able to provide a good user experience on on an application, right? And so many things uh, for any business, right? Whether it's a consumer like a startup or a large technology giant, or whether it's an enterprise. Um, you know, even if it's like a, a small store, um, so much of the way that they deliver technology to their end users is shifting to the front end, right? And the and the power of the application on the front end that GraphQL is becoming important. Um, and I think those two factors combined uh, are kind of causing a massive amount of GraphQL buzz uh, for uh, in the front end ecosystem. Um, now let's uh, change the topic a little bit to the best practices of uh, using GraphQL. What are some of the best practices, in your opinion, for using GraphQL? I think it depends a lot on the existing situation that you have. You know, maybe uh, let's say, for example, you have a monolithic application, um, or let's say you have microservices. Um, let's say you don't have front-end applications, and you have mostly service-to-service communication, uh, or you know, and and so you have kind of different scenarios, right? Let's say you're building a new application, or let's say you're kind of adding GraphQL to an existing application. Um, and so in all of those scenarios, the kind of different things or the best practices of using GraphQL vary. Um, but uh, what what is, um, and, and if I can kind of break down these individual scenarios uh, one by one, if you have an existing monolith and you want to use GraphQL, there is good tooling today. So what you would do is you would use a GraphQL kind of, um, I won't say framework, but you would use something like a GraphQL module or a GraphQL library. And this GraphQL library will allow you to create a GraphQL schema and map those GraphQL schemas to resolvers. And these resolvers that you implement will kind of talk to uh, the underlying controllers that you have within the monolith. And in this case, what you do is you, you have the ability to design a GraphQL schema that is similar to your REST models, but that also reflects the requirements of what the front-end developers want. Um, and so you can kind of design that GraphQL schema, and then you can build that out, um, and then you can map that. Now, depending on the framework that you're using, there are different approaches for doing this. One of the common approaches today is to have a GraphQL schema and then build manually write a GraphQL schema, which is a different language. So it's a different language altogether. Uh, you, you have a file, and inside that, you write the GraphQL uh, schema. That kind of becomes the URLs or the routes file, right? Uh, that's one approach. Uh, the other approach is if you are, for example, you have a Java, if you have some kind of typed language, right? Let's say you have Java or um, I think now maybe TypeScript. These languages, you are already modeling the resources, right? And in these cases, very often, like for example, with Spring Boot, you, you might not even be explicitly creating REST API endpoints, right? You might just be creating models. Um, and uh, the REST API endpoints are almost auto-generated, right? Um, and in these cases, actually, what you can do is you can, you know, you can just build your models, and these models will generate the GraphQL schema and the GraphQL API automatically for you. In this case, uh, you know, it basically your graphical schema reflects the kind of models that you have, and that kind of ends up working as well. So this is kind of like the different ways that you have um, on the monolithic side. Um, when you have microservices, uh, GraphQL becomes very painful uh, to use, um, and uh, this is this is actually a point of stress for the community at the moment, which is you know how how do we deal with GraphQL and microservices? I feel. Uh, there, there are many there are many different approaches that have emerged. Uh, a very common approach is the GraphQL gateway approach, um, and which is very very similar to the backend for front end approach, so the BFF approach, right? So what you do is you say um, I'm going to build. Uh, there's you take out a small team, like a team of two or three people, um, or you you know maybe the front end developers kind of decide to put together this team, uh, and this team now builds a GraphQL server, uh, and this GraphQL server. Uh, provides the kind of GraphQL schema and GraphQL API for the front-end developers or for the different applications that are being used. Uh, and on the back, it queries these different microservices uh, that you already have. I think the best practice for using GraphQL is what would give you uh, what really works for you. Uh, and I think it's very similar, again, to the early days of REST, where you know you have a lot of REST best practices and the way you should use REST verbs and the way you should do REST uh, model your resources. But once REST became an API that was used everywhere, you know people started crafting their REST API to be more suitable to what they wanted to do and you know what their application was doing. Um, and it automatically kind of went through changes, right? So there's a lot, a lot of convention that emerged around different kinds of domains, 
and how to use the REST API properly and what to do with the REST API. Um, and we are going to go through that journey with GraphQL as well, um, where we'll see many different kinds of use cases and best practices and patterns emerge around those use cases um, for, for how you can use GraphQL. So you have built a company to have the, uh, the team to use GraphQL for a cloud native application. Have you seen any interesting usage of GraphQL? It's been a fascinating journey for us. Um, you know, we, we're a we're an open source uh, engine. We launched just about a year ago, uh, and uh, you know, kind of uh, it, it it's a GraphQL engine that you know works with uh, Postgres database, um, and uh, we've now added the capability of it to be able to talk to other microservices, um, so that you can kind of connect different microservices together and create a unified GraphQL endpoint. Um, and uh, and our GraphQL engine takes care of being able to kind of you know join across uh, these services or join across what I call mid-tier services and databases um, and provide um, an authorization kind of system so that you can uh, you can expose the right parts of the GraphQL schema to the right end users, right? Sometimes you don't want to expose the whole GraphQL schema um, and you're able to enforce certain authorization policies. Uh, there is another transformation that is happening in the world you know, today, which is the whole cloud native transformation, uh, you know, movement from containers to uh, making containers stateless, right, uh, and to to even serverless functions, which is kind of like you know the extreme uh, of of a microservice, right? That that is an entire movement that is happening uh, in one part of the industry. So the backend developers are moving towards being event driven, uh, of being decoupled, having services, having microservices, having serverless functions, right? Of using you know multiple SaaS APIs, they use vendor products. Uh, they use uh, they use an API created by another team. So um, so that is kind of that is kind of one entire uh, industry movement that is happening, powered by Docker and Kubernetes and all of the cloud native innovation that is happening. And on the other end, you know, there's the front end team, uh, and the front end team wants GraphQL, and GraphQL works really well with a monolith, right? Uh, but it does not work really well with uh, microservices or serverless functions or whatever. Um, and so there's been a tremendous amount of interest uh, in trying to figure out how we can make both of those landscapes work well together, right? Um, in a naive way to connect a GraphQL API to various serverless functions and uh, microservices is not hard, uh, but to actually make that work at scale, to deal with performance, to deal with caching, to deal with security, um, it, it, it's, it requires a new form of thinking uh, for the organization to actually make GraphQL work really well, uh, you know, with a with a quote unquote cloud native backend. And by cloud native, I mean you know things that are uh, microservices and serverless functions and that are event driven, so that are stateless. Um, and and there's been a tremendous amount of interest in trying to make that work together. Uh, so so the short answer is yes. <laughs> there's a huge amount of interest in trying to make sure that we can we can get the best out of GraphQL for the application development team, and we can get the best out of our backend um, and backend agility, right? Um, and backend is a loose word, right? It means everything may be on the infrastructure uh, and get a tremendous amount of developer agility uh, on, on the backend as well. Excellent. So you touch base a little bit of uh, GraphQL and microservices and talk about how your company is trying to solve this issue. I wonder though, like, what, what are the pains and learning uh, between you, well, using GraphQL for microservices. You're right, right. Um, I think so. Um, so, so you know, like, like I was, I was mentioning a little bit before. Um, a, a GraphQL API is uh, powered by a GraphQL schema, um, and the GraphQL schema is essentially like a type system, right? Um, and so, if you if you come from a, if you if you programmed in a you know type language kind of environment or statically typed environment, you notice that you create types. Um, you build types or you build classes, uh, right? And functionally, maybe you build types or maybe you're building classes and objects and things like that. Um, and then as you're building things, uh, you know, let's say you make an error uh, in, you know, in the name of a particular type, right? Or the way you're referring to a particular type. So maybe like the user type has an address uh, field and the address field is pointing to an address type or a user class and an address class. Um, and let's say you make a spelling error uh, inside the way you refer to the address class from the user class. Um, when you build it, your compiler will tell you, you know what, here's a problem. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, ADRIS, right? You spelt address, like this This thing does not exist. Um, and so what you do as a developer is you're like, oh, okay, I need to go fix that. Um, and so you go fix it. Or maybe somebody else who's building a different module, uh, they, named the, they named their class user as well. 
And so now when they try to build it, they're like, hey, duplicate declaration, right? Don't, uh, what's happening? Um, and so then you as developers coordinate and you talk to each other uh, and you fix this problem. Um, but when you think about GraphQL with microservices, uh, each microservice defines their own set of APIs, right? Um, and and when you try to bring them together with GraphQL, what you're trying to say is, hey, these are the various types of microservice one, these are the various resources by microservice two, and these are maybe the relationships between microservice one and two, between the types exposed by microservice one and two. Now, the problem is that if you kind of think about the tooling of how these two microservices and types come together, um, this is very challenging, right? Because the same problems that I talked about, like maybe you are, maybe you want to connect the user type to the address type. Uh, how how do you keep track of the fact that the type names are evolving or changing, or that there are errors in the references that you've created, right? So maybe when you dynamically build a graph, how do you know that um, it actually makes sense, right? There's actually there are actually services um, that are handling this. This it it the the problem moves out from the build time and moves into like the runtime. Right, and and that's just more challenging to deal with, um, and um, and, and so that's kind of just maybe one example. But you can have all kinds of problems with overlapping types, or you can have like duplicate declarations and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience with uh, GraphQL and microservices. Currently, there's a working draft of uh, the GraphQL spec. What is new? What is coming up next? There are lots of discussions that are happening. Uh, in the GraphQL spec, in the GraphQL draft around how to be able to, uh, you know, namespace things or whether we should do it in GraphQL or not. Or um, when you think about GraphQL mutations and input types uh, of whether we want interfaces for input types or not. Um, and so there's a lot of active discussion there. Uh, but but for the most part, the bulk of the GraphQL spec has is uh, is is very solid. Um, a lot of a lot of the stuff that uh, you need to do that you need to build is all pretty much done. There are a few nuances that I think are being worked out, um, and I think there's a lot of pressure from the GraphQL and microservices side of things um, to move the GraphQL spec in a particular direction. But so far, GraphQL is very solid, and the and the spec is really solid. Is there any topic that you would like to cover that is not covered today? I would urge folks to go try out GraphQL and learn GraphQL. So and that's that's really easy to do, um, at least to learn about GraphQL, right? Whether you decide to use it or not. Uh, tremendous amount, lots of resources to be able to kind of quickly build an application with GraphQL on the front end, or use a GraphQL API on the front end, or uh, you know build a small GraphQL server just to get a flavor of what it takes. Um, and and I know I mentioned a lot of challenges with GraphQL, uh, but you know I I absolutely love GraphQL and I think it's uh, it's going to be amazing. So it's important for us as a community to you know get hands on uh, and and experience the benefits of GraphQL. Um, use a GraphQL API, integrate a GraphQL API, understand the nuances of GraphQL, uh, uh, and uh, and then I think that will help the community kind of evolve and figure out uh, what the different kinds of things we can do with GraphQL are. What is the best way to learn about GraphQL? Mm, there are there are many different resources depending on what you're trying to do. Um, I think on the depending on the language or the framework that you're using. If you're a backend developer, um, you there are several nice tutorials. Uh, you can just uh, if you just search for um, this, like this, uh, there's something called Awesome GraphQL, which has a bunch of resources uh, on the specific backend framework and what kind of uh, uh, GraphQL library you can use. And they usually have some nice tutorials. Um, on the front end side of things, uh, there are lots of egg, there are lots of courses on Egghead uh, that uh, have a nice introduction to GraphQL or Udemy. Um, we maintain an open source uh, set of tutorials on learn.hustler.io uh, where you can uh, kind of take two hours to learn how to integrate GraphQL into your React app as a React developer. So we have tutorials for React, Angular, Flutter, ReasonML, Elm, TypeScript, uh, and iOS, Android, and React Native as well, uh, all maintained by the community uh, and kind of helps you get started with GraphQL super fast. The, the best way to, to find resources for GraphQL is usually to scope it in by the specific technology stack that you want to be interested in. Um, if you generally want to get a flavor for what the GraphQL API is, um, you can head to the graphql.org uh, website. Um, but from my personal experience, um, reading about GraphQL did not help me as much as when I used GraphQL to build a front-end application. And that's when things started clicking for me. Um, so I would encourage you to kind of build something with GraphQL, um, especially on the front-end to understand the uh, power of GraphQL. <laughs>
thank you for joining us today, Tama. It was has been a really useful conversation with you on GraphQL. Thank you, Ogno, for having me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Codish Podcast. Codish is produced by Heroku, the easiest way to deploy, manage, and scale your applications in the cloud. If you'd like to learn more about Codish or any of Heroku's podcasts, please visit heroku.com/podcasts. 